Hello there, sorry from 17 once again. This is my Kingdom Hearts 2 Critical Difficulty video walkthrough. This is Space Paranoids 2.0, and I just stood still for a few seconds there, and I have no idea why I did that. But we're off and moving once again through the familiar territory of Hollow Bastion. And throughout this walkthrough, I've been making sure to remind you guys that you won't really see me entering shops and things. And this right here is to give you just a, an idea of, of what I've been doing every time I've been coming to these places. Because the, one of the, the major tenets of being a, a walkthrough maker is, I feel, a responsibility of tailoring what is in your walkthrough. You know, you're creating something that's meant to be a cohesive vision of, of help to get through a game, or maybe you make a walkthrough under a different mentality and you want it to feature different things. But for me, it only has to really contain the things I think you need to see. So a lot of the superfluous details, like me going back to shops every time we come back here, is not something necessarily that you want um, on every single video because it gets to the point where you know, you're gonna wish it wasn't there. And if it isn't there, you don't get to make that wish. But every so often it is great to show you what I do. And this is one of those instances where I've come to Hollow Bastion again, I've checked out their equipment, I've dumped off with the Moogle, I've checked out to make sure there's nothing I can make. And uh, I just want to remind folks that I've been doing that at every major feature of this game. You just haven't been seeing it because I don't really think there's a point. But once you get back to the house, you're going to be engaging against some Heartless. You'll notice they are the Space Paranoid type from uh, Inside Tron. And these purple guys right here, incredibly dangerous. I cannot even begin to tell you how dangerous that enemy is. Never let up on it, always kill it first. The good news is, we currently have the... Uh, I forget the name of this Keyblade. It's the one for beating the experiment. Something to do with a pumpkin, I think it's called. Uh, it's the Halloween Town themed Christmas pumpkin. And it is a really, really good Keyblade because... One thing you might not realise on Kingdom Hearts 2, but it's kind of less about stats on the Keyblade and more about what the Keyblade actually does. And on this game, the abilities that this Keyblade has make it arguably one of the best Keyblades in the game. For a, an early level playthrough, for a playthrough that's not going to be crafting things like the Ultimate Weapon and such, it is by far the most powerful option, especially if you're going to be using a lot of combos against people. The, the joy of this Keyblade is, the longer the combo, the bigger the payoff on the finisher is. And uh, it is staggeringly dangerous when you accompany it with things like, you know, explosion and, and, and certain finishing attacks like that. And you can take out bosses like Terra really reliably with this Keyblade. And uh, to me, it's kind of interesting because I've always kind of been that Kingdom Hearts player that always went for the ultimate weapon, always kind of tried to fashion it and... I think that comes, that stems from a, a Final Fantasy upbringing. You know, as soon as you learnt this notion of ultimate weapons, or the best weapon, which is kind of what they were always kind of considered to be, it's it's one of those ways of thinking that's very difficult to break because it's it's a stubborn way of thinking. And in this game, and the Final Mix edition of Kingdom Hearts 2, of course, the ultimate weapon is still probably the best Keyblade for for its length for its strength and its magic, but uh, as you've seen in my gameplay, I'm not the biggest magic user, so right now we're using the best equipment that we can as far as attack, and I kind of slept on this Keyblade until I realised just how damaging it was when I got uh, one that was statistically, you know, slightly better than it, and I put it on and I noticed there was something really missing, and that's when you truly realise that, your dog, this is a pretty damn good weapon. But this is a sequence that I could have trimmed out, but I decided to leave it in because it's another thing. This is kind of a video to remind you of what we do in this game when we're not, you know, cohesively and succinctly going through and doing everything specifically very quickly and, and you know, getting stuff done. Most areas I traverse through where I've trimmed out sections, I've done what you're seeing right now. I've killed mobs of enemies that you've seen me kill before and I've saved you the, you know, frustration of having to watch too much of it. Unless you're the guy who loves watching that stuff and you're probably watching someone else's content because I'm kind of merciless with with how I cut some of the stuff. Of course, I do leave certain things in and I do make mistakes, but for the most, I always try and feel like it has a purpose of being in there. 
And then there's moments like this when I'm clearly checking my, my capture systems or something on my computer where I stand still for a few seconds, which could be edited out, but you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of kind of just rolling with it. Of course, if it were to negatively affect it, that'd be slightly different. Ooh, that's a development. We just tried to use magnets, and I'm about to die. Wow, these creatures are very dangerous. Uh, the room back to Tron 2, real, real tough. There's a lot of those giant, crazy red nocturne enemy people, and they do that chain fire attack, which you can reflect back at them and kill them, but if you don't, it looks a little bit like what you just saw. So... A good option here is to completely skip the fights, unless you want to. Because at any moment this can go real south real fast, and... I suppose if you want to get bright gems or lucid gems, you can work towards those. To be completely honest though, don't think that they're anywhere near as useful as they were in Kingdom Hearts 1. One of the things I noticed when I was last playing this game, which has been quite a long time ago now, the resources for making the better stuff don't seem to be the same ones that were, you know, the rare ones in the last game. And having a memory bank of that kind of information is probably really confusing because it's different between versions of the game and it's different between sequels, so kind of interesting, but very dangerous place here. Super dangerous, and uh, that is a sentiment that's going to transition into the level 2. Because this creature here, this guy, you notice how he's got two life bars? Well, one and a, a little bit. He's just... Oh, you see the finishing move? That was two finishing moves right there. The launcher and the finisher. Big damage against him. So good. So much fun. But we're going to be doing... Um, the, is it the Lunar Flyer or something like that? We're doing some kind of flying machine. And... I'm blanking on the name completely. You'll see it shortly once we enter the computer. And it's essentially just a bunch of timed fights. There's nothing too much to it. But the timed fights are quite difficult because I think there is a weight allowance on the lift which can fail you if too many enemies are still alive at the same time. And of course on critical, the enemies take more damage, they do more damage, so it can be quite dangerous getting you know into the right position to, to sort everything out and, and get to where you need to be. Uh, after you've finished speaking to NPCs and watching cutscenes, hit the computer, get inside it, and then jump into the light cycle section. And instead of a light cycle, it's going to put you into a fight. So, this is another very dangerous looking fight because there's two of those creatures, so immediately you'll notice I go into the Trinity. And I'm going to try and use the Trinity to make the most of my limit gauge, and then I'm going to finish them off with the combo ender and hopefully suck in a ton of people. So, there goes the life bar draining. See the crit, what does the crit do? Wow, it doesn't do one big final hit, interesting. Oh, and there was the, the weapon. Really interesting when you get those finishes working, so good. But there was a level up for Sora, we're currently level 41. Not too sure about levels on this game, as opposed to what's high, what's low, and what you want to be to be places. You'll notice between this one and the first game, the first game told you a level specific for the level's combat. This one just kind of tells you by those stars to how difficult it's going to be. And I guess it never really equates as to what a star is worth or, or what its value is. So it's just a case of the more stars, the harder. But other than that, there's no real finesse to knowing truly what the challenge that awaits she was going to be. Wow, what the hell was that? That looked like some kind of crazy multi-hit stun attack. Maybe it was Goofy spinning, maybe it was me getting hit. I was too busy taking a sip of water. <laughs> but IGN have been covering Bloodborne for the last month or so in, in lead up to the release of it. And today they released a making of part 2 video. And it was kind of misleading, I felt. And I often feel that IGN are incredibly misleading, but that's how you, you're successful on the internet. You have to be misleading. And it just kind of sucks for those people that appreciate, you know, a little bit of just gusto and candor of, of honesty, as I show you a convincing way on how to die quickly in this game if you don't play correctly. And the video didn't really tell you why it was an exclusive. It just showed you some benefits 
that Sony have brought to it, and those benefits were, were more of an appraisal and some dick rubbing than anything else. And they were essentially just praising Miyazaki and saying that From Software are, are known for being quite a different developer and, and and just mentioning how they were trying their best to help them and stuff. It, it was that mutually beneficial relationship that a lot of developers and publishers have and, and sometimes don't. And there was no real new information about the game. But that kind of seems like the theme of, of those features, doesn't it? We've seen a a chorus of the boss track being played by an orchestra which was really nice but we didn't really learn much and then we had the exact same you know, video played twice the only difference being is the second time around we had the developer commentary on it so it seems like they've been very tight-lipped and specific about just how much they present uh, and I think in the long run it's a good thing because how much of Bloodborne have we seen? Not a lot We've seen a little bit of those chalice dungeons being mentioned, we've seen a, a video of that hunter turned werewolf who you fight as a boss, and you've seen a few co-op experiences with it. We've seen him kill a couple of rats, we've seen that new video with the rapier and gunblade thing. And then we've seen the alpha footage, and then the daylight footage of the alpha stage. And that's pretty much it. So when you think about Bloodborne, we really don't know anything about the game or the locations outside of maybe one to two areas. We know they're putting an emphasis on that graveyard place with that really wispy looking tree. And we know of course that there is the, the Yarnum, Yarnum city that we've seen. But outside of that, you know, we have no real context of, of what that world is going to be full of. Is it going to be like Kingdom Hearts where one world is, you know, water, the other one is kind of orientally themed along those lines of vastly different experiences in places or is it all going to be focused around Yarnum and just have it slightly deviating from the formula with tunnels and you know underground systems and caves and what have you and maybe entering some kind of ornate and, and complex catacombs or churches or any kind of building so we really don't know and I was kind of hoping that they would show off something in a completely different setting. Like, show me, you know, seaside. Show me him on a giant dark galleon surfing, you know, a black tide with really menacing looking storm clouds above and moving through a thunderstorm towards a lone island somewhere. You know, show us something so different to what we're expecting that it's going to totally blow us away. And every single time I think things like that... Oh, by the way, this is the, the mission, guys. You have to kill these things relatively quickly because that bar on the left is going to fill up and if it fills you will hit a fail state. It can be very frustrating because these enemies are damage sponges. They take a big beating and apparently uh, my level might be a little bit low for killing them very quickly. So you'll notice I've swapped my Keyblade up to one that gives me perhaps more magic power. Oh no, I haven't. I've just changed drives and it's turned the colour of it. My bad. I say drives. We're, we're in Tronland. Of course it's going to be blue. <laughs> So I'm still using the same amazing Keyblade, the difference being is I went into limit form then and did a couple of the limit attacks and now I'm just trying to, to combo the best as I can, bring them towards me, push them away, meet them halfway, launch them, you know, keep them suspended, stunlock, stunlock, Kingdom Hearts goodness 101. But every time I start thinking about things like that with Bloodborne, it makes me realise if they were to share something like that, it'd probably diminish the value of it when we saw it in the games. They're probably holding all those things off, and that's if those things even exist. There's something really important happened there. I was in the middle of a stun getting hit continually, but it allowed me to go through my menus because I couldn't act. And when I activated my drive form, it broke me out of the stun lock. So I'm not too sure if I've mentioned it or if you were aware of it, but if you are fast enough on the menus, you can toggle your way out of stun locks by activating drive form. It's not going to be resource you know, friendly, but it'll definitely save your life should you need it in a crisis. But thank you very much for watching, and you take care now.